I don't think uh, I will introduce myself much more really, um, to be honest. Thank you, Kim, for introducing me. And um, I've got uh, a bio slide here, which kind of gives you a sense of who I am uh, and where I'm from and what I'm interested in uh, doing, really. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, I, I work in the department, I teach on the theatre curriculum, but the work that I make, the artistic practice and the kind of research that I'm interested in is related to uh, agriculture and to farming life worlds. And I think what I try and do in the work that I make is to translate those worlds in their complexity to a, a wider non-farming population. And I think the reason why I've ended up sort of coming full circle, as it, as it were, and, and actually using my own experiences of being a, a farmer and a farmer's daughter as well, is that I think as a farmer, you have these experiences of, of the world which are very closed off from other people's realities. And often I think we don't appreciate that other people might not be able to enter our world in, in, in any way, shape or form if we assume that they already understand food production and livestock husbandry and all of those things. So that's kind of where my interest kind of stems from. How do we kind of explore and explain those to a public? Um, this, this presentation is a, I guess it's a, a re-articulation of, of a finished writing and that's just gone in a, to area journal uh, in a draft form. I, I think it will need quite a lot of work, but um, it's good I'm testing out on some people to see if it makes sense even, because uh, who knows, it could be uh, sending you all to sleep very soon. So I'm just going to crack on um, and just, I will just um, carry on with my presentation now. With a resurgence in public environmental awareness in recent years, has come the desire and the interest to find practical ways of mitigating the human effect on the natural world and of reconnecting human beings with nature. One approach now circulating widely within the public domain is the idea of rewilding, developed by the Wildlands Project in North America in the 1980s, but popularised really over the past, well, 10, 15 years, maybe up to 20 years um, within Europe and especially. And as it's become more popularised, we could say that the term itself has moved and shifted from um, its scientific origin to its um, a popular and to within vernacular usage, everyday use then. And although it has a multitude of meanings and has been accused of being overly plastic or porous as a term, it is generally accepted that rewilding's aims are to restore functioning ecosystems through a process of reintroducing or restoring wild organisms and or ecological processes and ecosystems uh, to ecosystems, sorry, where such organisms and processes are, need, are either missing or are dysfunctional. This article explores rewilding from perhaps a soci sociological point of view, examining the tensions that became evident in the development of a Summit to Sea project, which was a £3.4 million, 10,000 hectare rewilding project in the Cambrian Mountains, which is very local to us here, of course, and was heralded as Rewilding Britain's flagship project in the UK. Current land management practices in the Cambrian Mountains are the traditional agricultural practices of upland sheep farming. And with such practices comes a deeply located and embodied experience of the world. Perceptions of, those, uh, of the uplands for those who live and work in these predominantly Welsh speaking areas are tied to conceptualizations of Welsh nationhood developed 
in antithesis to the dominant neighbour, that is England, and centred around collective cultural and politicised memories of state exploitation of Welsh land, perhaps. As such, the Cambrian Mountains and the uplands of Wales are almost always politicised. In this paper, I argue that the development of Rewilding Britain's Summit to Sea project was poorly received, perhaps by the local farming community for a number of reasons. Firstly, Rewilding Britain appeared slightly naive to the polit political resonance of the upland areas of Wales. Secondly, the desire and the ambition to truly listen and engage with local inhabitants was not followed through, which in my opinion left a number of ethical issues under considered. For the purposes of this presentation, the post-colonial lens is a means to examine the way that the Summit to Sea project reveals perhaps particular attitudes towards the otherness of Wales, its people and land. As such, the post-colonial lens offers a way to view the project within a wider framework centred around state exploitation of Welsh natural resources and cultural perceptions of Welsh landscape. We might appreciate the post-colonial lens as a means to allow the local to be opened up into the possibilities of hybridity, of connecting the local and specific to wider global relationships of power, subalterity and subjugation. As such, we might perceive an articulation of global processes within a localised space. There is a phrase that was coined by Victorian travel writers visiting Wales that has long been a source of real, real irritation for me. A phrase still in circulation that I hear, hear local people saying as well as tourists, and that is um, a phrase that's kind of ripe with colonial resonance and it has somehow sort of left its impression on us here. The Welsh Green Desert is used to describe the area of land that is more accurately called the Cambrian Mountains, an area designated for rewilding by the maps of the Summit to Sea project, and an area of land lambasted by George Monbiot, who describes it as a bare waste of sheep-scraped misery and as sheep-wrecked. Monbiot and others follow a lineage of perceptions and impositions about rural Welsh environments as being empty, bleak, picturesque and sublime. The Victorian elite popularised the British Grand Tour, of course, bringing the romantic and picturesque Wales, um, a vision of, of myth and mystery through its popular literature. And some have connected the reframing of wild land, wild land by the picturesque movement um, with the North American wilderness movement. Others have noted its development in relationship to the homogenization of British colonial lands, whilst others have commented on the othering of Welsh people in relation to ideas of romantic primitivism and of the noble savage. The Welsh landscape picture and its perception as empty uh, and unpeopled. Um, the Welsh its perception empty and unpeopled um, has been utilised to justify the state use of its natural resources, such as the, de the forced depopulation of Capel Kellen to create the Truerin Reservoir for the people of Liverpool, the post-war retention of 500,000 acres of land for the British military, much of, what, much of which is, is still in use to an extent, um, and in 1940, the eviction of over 50 families from an epint by the War Department. Finally, and most relevant to my discussion perhaps here, are the various land acquisitions in the post-war period by the Forestry Commission. So the Forestry Commission were a state-run um, commercial forestry service that were, were formed in uh, the aftermath of World War, War I to produce, uh, not only to produce timber, but to a forest upland environments, um, post-industrial and upland environments in Great Britain. 
In order to develop local support for afforestation, the Forestry Commission pitched their proposals in marketing materials as a means of settling families onto the land, but also as a solution to the depopulation of the hills, whilst also marketing forestry as more lucrative than agricultural, traditional agricultural practices and businesses. Here then, the discourse points to both and cultural preservation, something that really ties into the, to the feeling, uh, uh, the national feeling about these places. And is also a rhetoric that we see repeated in Rewilding Britain's uh, project announcements later on. In the 1950s, the Forest Commission were very unpopular in Wales, and as uh, Enoch Powell asserted in the House of Commons, the two words Forestry Commission are probably the most hated and reviled in the whole of Wales, he said. In the South Wales Valleys, the Dovey Valley and the Towey Valley, the Forestry Commission was criticised for hostile land acquisition practices. They were likened to a colonial army and referred to as having acquired land through a kind of English Stalinism. An interesting narrative of opportunism and exploitation emerges in Neris Owens's exploration of the Forestry Commission's attempt at compulsory land uh, purchase of 20,000 acres of the uplands in the Towey Valley in 1949. Interestingly, unbeknownst to the locals, the Forestry Commission had made their first purchase actually in 1946-1947 in the aftermath of that extreme weather event when four million sheep had actually perished. Suggesting that the, the Forestry Commission were subtly, or not so subtly, exploiting the um, precarious situation of local farming communities that resulted from that extreme weather event and resulted in the residents feeling that they had subsequently been deprived of their inheritance. Through an exploration of Welsh writers, Kirsty Bohata suggests how the Forestry Commission in Wales has been constructed as an alien colonising force who depict the afforestation of the hills as the erasure of place. As Bohata acknowledges, place within post-colonial discourse remains an important organising concept and Welsh culture invests enormous emotional and often political importance in its ideas. The politicisation of land and the geographical discourse of Welshness has been central to the construction of a territorially rooted sense of national identity. Pierce Griffith suggests that ideas around Evro Gamraig, a rural Welsh-speaking heartland, became central to a rural idealism that made its way into national political discourse. The upland areas of Wales are thus seen as strategically important strongholds of Welsh, Welshness and cultural integrity. Rural space in Wales is therefore always political. In October 2018, a map appeared in the local paper announcing rewilding Britain's Summit to Sea project. Within the line marking the project area on the map, I could just make out the spot where I stood on my farm in Talabont. The announcement that they had already secured 3.4 million pounds of funding from the Endangered Landscapes programme was surprising to me as I had not been made aware of local involvement or consultation in the project. At the launch of the Endangered Landscapes programme, Summit to Sea CEO Rebecca Wrigley gave a short talk which outlined the aims and the ambition of the project. In the talk, Wrigley offers the description of the project as follows. This is a transcription from the video recording. An area that's suffering economic decline, 
with low incomes, a high dependency on subsidies and insufficient income and employment to keep young people in their communities. So this context and the context of Brexit and the uncertainty that that brings provides opportunities. Wrigley constructs a narrative of an ecologic or economically sorry, impoverished community and able to survive in a post Brexit world. Here we might see a likeness to the marketing ploy of the Forestry Commission and the opportunistic purchasing of land in the Toby Valley in the aftermath of the winter of 1946. But more than this, by Wrigley choosing to speak for the people of the Cambrian Mountains um, and surrounding areas, communities are deprived of the opportunity to represent themselves. Their autonom autonomy is undermined by experts who reconstruct their existence elsewhere in order to fulfill a specific function with, within particular spaces of discourse. Now, Rewilding Britain withdrew from the project uh, as the kind of central organisation of the project in October, I think, 2019, citing local unhappiness with their involvement as the cause. And partner organisations have been sort of left to, to re, rethink perhaps the project and to start from scratch in many ways to try and get the project up and running again. Um, but the main point um, I wanted to make here is that um, the release of a funding document that was uh, drafted on, for submission in 2017 actually by Rewilding Britain and another partner I think who were in charge of the finances um, came to light recently and I was really interested to be able to actually see what they were because the communication hadn't been altogether clear about what the actual route or, or cause or the sort of methodologies that they were hoping to employ within this project were. So I've been able to look at that, but I won't go into those kind of details. They're really fascinating, but anyway. Um, but what I do want to draw your attention to is that in this funding document, there is this constant acknowledgement throughout of the importance of consultation, of transparency and local involvement in the project design. And here we have the following examples um, to show the repetition of this messaging. So community involvement from the very beginning with peer-to-peer -peer design from the bottom up with the expertise of farmers and fishers at its heart um, and so on and so forth. Now, however well-meaning the ambition, the scale of that consultation prior to the re receiving of that funding for the project is, in my opinion, not really sufficient. They state that they've spoken to 25 farmers and landowners and had some shareholding meetings. That, that, in my opinion, is not enough. That needs to go at a much greater depth in order to gain sort of a, a local support then. Um, so here then there appears to be a mismatch between what is stated and articulated within the funding document uh, and what is actually actioned in practice. And I think there is this lack of understanding perhaps of the importance um, of of taking seriously the voices of the local inhabitants. And this was one of the reasons why local speculation and cynicism and anger actually ousted rewilding Britain from the project. As Lorimer et al suggest, opposition to rewilding is particularly likely where projects are perceived as being imposed from the outside with little consideration for local interests. In this case, no one from Rewilding Britain asked local people if they even desired such a project. Secondly, Rewilding Britain underestimated the political power and resonance that any change in land use has within the Welsh uplands. Thirdly, and some commentators um, drew attention to this, they saw that the project was a parallel activity to global agribusiness land grabbing because of the funding's ties with um, a particular multimillionaire S, um, Lisbeth Rousing, um, um, inheritor of Tetra Pak, um, and therefore kind of painted a, a, a sort of colonial resonance to their sort of, um, yeah, to them being involved in the project or financiers of 
So such issues then are seen as reverberations of past attitudes and values towards Welsh land as resource for exploitation, extraction, tourism, a place to facilitate British interests or as places of whimsical value for the wealthy elite. Having said all that, I'm going back to the farmers now. So the title of this is Listening to Farmers, Gender and Embodied uh, Local Knowledge. And really what I'm thinking about is the kinds of knowledges that would be lost if we don't take on that invitation to listen to the people that are already here. This environment is not unpeopled. It's not abandoned landscapes that we're talking about. These are places that have people. Um, these are places that have working farms. These are places, um, they're storied landscapes. Um, so let's go back to the stories, as it were, and what, what we can learn from them. So this final section of the paper tries to reveal the key understandings that have emerged during my 10 years or so of making artistic work about farmers. Having discussions with farmers, which is usually about the weather, <laughs> but um, something that I really enjoy talking about is the weather and sheep, but um, I won't go off on one now. Um, yeah, discussions with farmers and yeah, my lifelong kind of experience of growing up and living and, and farming myself. So we might understand that these knowledges that result, I think, from the translated potential of my artistic practice and research are situated knowledges. That is, they are not objective truths where my own beingness has been subtracted from their construction. They are partial, incomplete, hybrid, and defined by my gendered subjectivity within the patriarchal world of my farming community. And there I am, for those of you who know me, I've probably seen this picture a million times, so apologies, I'll have to find another one, uh, a better the gendered female through a series of acts which are renewed, revised and consolidated through time, I cannot transgress my gender identity. I can never be man enough to be thought of as farmer proper and my capabilities are constricted um, by my continual performance of traditionally gendered farm roles. This, I would say, has resulted in my exclusion from acquiring the embodied knowledges and experiences that would be normalised for young boys growing up on upland farms and inheritance of land and property afforded men. Such exclusion from masculine gendered knowledges allows me to perceive the upland farming system and culture that I grew up in from the outside while simultaneously allowing a, a sort of retention of, of that knowledge or some sort of knowing from the inside as well. Through the various artistic projects and research activities I've undertaken in the area, it has become clear that within these patriarchal systems, gendered embodied knowledge is not only an important element of the continuation of patriarchal ideals, but such knowledge is produce masculine identities, bodies, and ways of being in the world that complicates the nature-human dichotomy and produce and maintain certain ideas around what it means to be a Welsh farmer. Rewilding's emphasis on the non-human animal means that it often appears indifferent and even antithetical the myriad of ways through which humans appropriate the world. In so doing, these discourses misconstrue farming and farmers to an extent, I am generalizing a little bit, in nature. ...has been used to the detriment of the upland farming community as a means to undermine their understandings, their expertise, and their experiences of the ecosystems already on their farm, part of the, the farming world. And instead, position ecologists, conservationists, and other related professionals as the gatekeepers of expert ecological and environmental knowledge 
I'm not saying for one minute that ecologists, conservationists um, are not professional, don't have that expert knowledge. Uh, I'm saying that there is there are lots of different kinds of knowledges and actually we can think about the knowledge that farmers already have in relation to their land and what they know as a, as a means of, of, of opening dialogue around these things really. So during a performance I made with my research participants called The Only Places We Ever Knew, some of you might have been there, might remember, um, I attempted to deconstruct the domination of the landscape picture on the farm where I was raised by integrating the hidden, situated and embodied knowledges of my um, father and my research participant, Glyn Jones. At one point during the three hour guided walk, Glyn points to a plant on the Esker, explaining its importance to the audience by reciting an old hymn by his father. Han well dir vilvru de wartheg di arvi thru. When you see this field wood rush, your cattle will prosper. By attempting to guide the audience's perception, the landscape picture is deconstructed by the deliberate shifting of visual scale from macro to micro. Such relations attempt to rupture the nature human dichotomy, allowing in the moment of linguistic utterance a foregrounding of nature culture connected and hybridized through the activities of upland sheep farming. Such knowledge is specific and situated, constituted through patrilineal inheritance while simultaneously drawing in on and around past, current and future experiences of the natural world located on the farm. In an interview I undertook for the film Dear Mick Jagger, uh, yeah, it's a long story about the title, I can tell you at, at some other point. Um, Glyn Jones suggests uh, that when it comes to the particular acts of uh, grazing your stock on the mountain, a farmer should know how many sheep to put up there. He asserted that if you put too many sheep on the mountain, your sheep will suffer too. Such knowledge may seem insignificant, but once again, these demonstrate a praxis that relies on embodiment and hybridity of understanding particular ecologies of plants and animals at work within the agricultural environment. During three years of fieldwork and a lifetime of listening to my father's anecdotes, Ben's experience and a relationship to the wildlife uh, on the farm extends its presence through the stories that he tells, the repeating narratives. Things like discussing and naming and finding out about the plants in the sites of special scientific interest, reporting seeing ringed oozles and crossbills and getting excited, or the when the um, when the um, osprey came to live uh, in Glandavi Estuary, we actually saw it once over the land and the excitement around seeing such a, a gracious and wonderful bird uh, sort of coming and coming close to us in that way. There were rescue attempts for otters that were injured and deer um, and also leverets that were in the wrong place at the wrong time needed gently moving from molehill, for example, out of the tractor's way. He also repeatedly praised Gorse for its, uh, its sheltering of his sheep and of the local birds of populations. Now, his appreciation of such, such things was not really for profit, nor for the benefit of others, but was instead a part of his field of care. Rather than antipathy and disregard, wild nature is valued as part of the ecologies of these upland agricultural lands. Locally situated knowledge uh, was also evident during interviews undertaken as part of my commissioned film for the Hydrogenship Research Project. Um, during filmed conversations with my participant, Gwilym, uh, he revealed his understanding of the relationship between agricultural policy 
and farming practice and ecological harm, connecting the dots between all those things. Um, Gwilym is the older gentleman at the bottom of this slide here. And he said, and this is a translation of, of the interview, he says, after the war, the government came, um, the government policy came out and agriculture changed for the worse. Grants were bought out for all kinds of silly things and farmers were to take this money. We were misinformed. They should have listened to the old people. And this is what has upset things here. That's the effect of Glastier today, to try and undo the things that were done during that time. Here then, Gwilym connects ecological harm with a change in agricultural methods uh, and policy that was uh, brought out in the post-war period. And he suggested also in the interview that these policies had a direct effect not only on local uh, knowledge and practice, but also on the sharing of labour within small rural communities. There was a shift from um, helping each other to being more concerned about your own um, your own farming practices and what you're doing and the money that you're making. Um, there was another moment, it was a really lovely moment with Gwilym where he, he took me down to the river and we looked over a little bridge into the water and he was he was almost in tears because he was explaining to me that years ago there were lots of little trout in the river and they were all gone and he said that he used to he used to love seeing them and in that moment he's almost in tears and it was just a really poignant moment of understanding that these experiences of the natural world are every day there is an everyday and that's integral to to those those life worlds then. So my favourite subject, um, some of you who know me will know I'm a bit sheep mad and may have heard some of my arguments in this part of the paper before. So it could be easily argued that within popular discussion around rewilding in the uplands of Wales and elsewhere in the UK, Sheep have been made scapegoat. I tried to think of a clever pun there um, on sheep, but I'm back to goats. So yeah, sheep have been made scapegoat. I'm sure that many would laugh at my deep hurt when sheep are referred to as the white plague or woolly maggots. <laughs> However, my long term understanding of the co-speciesism between farmer and flock leads me to assert that the ambition of rewilding to shift farming to a nature-based economy and ultimately to an extent away from livestock husbandry underestimates the power of sheep within these particular locales. Working directly with material gathered over the three years of fieldwork on the farm, uh, my film Dear Mick Jagger explores the relationship with my family, my of Welsh mountain sheep. During the film, I argue that uh, we are defined by our association with the flock and we become those human beings alongside our animals. The sheep transfer something of themselves onto us as human beings in the world. But I would argue also that more specifically, perhaps that sheep co-create masculine bodies through repetitive tasks that are embodied in men. I often joke that I can spot a sheep farmer a mile off from the way he walks, from his awkward, cumbersome gait, as though his boots were filled with water. I see my tide, my grandfather, but mostly I see an embodiment of sheep. One could argue that such a way of moving not only is inherited through mimetic performances of gendered behaviour, but is eventually truthfully embodied and co-produced by many of the physical stances involved in the care of sheep. Eventually, such poses, often with knees tightly holding a sheep between the legs and bent over at the waist, begin to settle to the body, throwing the joints into permanent imbalance so that internal erosion becomes an outward 
manifestation or involuntary expression of a hybrid masculine identity. These are the fleshy knottings and enfoldings of the flesh that Donna Haraway talks about. Sheep, of course, are historically produced bodies that have played active roles in the British accumulation of capital. Such values are often embedded within the specific genetics or the bloodlines of individual flocks on individual farms. These values are not only specific to the individual farms, but can also afford the farmer the status of good stockman, a skill often considered to have, they have to have been inherited uh, from their forefathers. Within events such as marts or agricultural shows, farm men perform their masculinity around and through their appreciation of sheep. The sheep become uniquely tied to male kinship and individual status within a wider farming society. I argue that shared human life experiences produce particular human beings, not one separate from nature and the wild, but one intimately tied to and constructed by the mundane and daily experiences of farm life. The potential of rewilding to erode such valued animal human culture could cause catastrophic emotional damage, especially to the men folk whose subjectivity and identity is co-constructed within the cultural frameworks of upland farming and sheep breeding especially. Without sheep, our very existence as beings in the world is compromised. In conclusion, then, I hope there's some sort of through line coming through where I'm going with this. There might not be. Hopefully you get where, where I'm going or hoping to go. Um, in conclusion, then, rewilding's positionality within a wider field of environmental discourse appears to actively challenge the hegemonic land use practices of upland sheep farming, especially uh, within the Cambrian Mountains. Rewilding, then, for local inhabitants here, and the surrounding areas might be perceived as the erasure of self, of the embodied knowledge discussed in the latter part of this talk, and of a collective identity and sense of Welsh nationhood. Rewilding often situates wild nature as having autonomy. However, as Hint suggests, any ambition or design which attempts to preserve or recreate autonomous, pristine, wild nature is always a social construction. There is no ontological divide between social nature, developed, degraded, managed, and external nature, wild, pristine, ecological. As such, rewilding needs to take the ethics for both humans and animals seriously and acknowledge that implementing rewilding is likely to always mean some species lose and others win. In the case of the Cambrian Mountains, Locally specific breeds of sheep and hefted flocks would surely be one of the losers, um, along with the ecologies that have grown with them as they have been specifically bred for those locations. Once you get rid of a flock from a mountain, you can't ever get it back in the same way it would take so many lifetimes. Sheep begin um, to work symbiotically with their environment. The tick-borne diseases that they might pick up on someone else's land, they wouldn't necessarily get those. Um, they would have some sort of immunity uh, to them on the land where they currently live and are hefted to. Living in the Anthropocene means our, um, our whole world is interconnected in vast and complex ways. And I think caution is needed so that rewilding is not hailed as the only answer. I'm not saying it's not of use value at all, but it's not the answer to our problems. Furthermore, and uh, it's my opinion that those who have popularised rewilding for the general public have already achieved significant harm in their inability to engage with and negotiate the complexity 
and the sensitivity needed to deal with and to and to think about and negotiate and to have a dialogue with land use practices. And unfortunately, I'm picking on George Monbiot again, poor man. But although George Monbiot suggests in Feral that rewilding should be used cautiously, he makes a clear point about that. And never, ever with the intention to dispossess people. His repeated vilification of farming in his other forms of writing, in his columns and his, his journalism, has done little to allow a space for meaningful dialogue. And one could argue that such attitudes could be seen as a recapitulation of past attitudes towards Welsh upland environments and people, as, as discussed earlier in the presentation. Finally, although it is unlikely that rewilding Britain meant any harm when they began to develop the in practice, they came across as, um, as thinking like this, that local support means educating uninformed locals as to the wisdom of your proposal and hopefully swaying them over to your side of the cause. Hmm, that's not an ethically uh, productive way to, to go around these things. And perhaps rewilding is not the right kind of methodology to be implemented within the uplands of Wales. And if it is, it certainly needs more defining in what they actually mean by the word, because that word is very, very widely used and um, has a lot of meanings. It's a cluster concept, yeah. Um, but it, what's become even more apparent recently, I've been thinking about this, is how um, the impact of COVID on tourism and how in most situations rewilding shifts from a production-based model of land use into ecotourism and nature-based economies. So perhaps we need to rethink that and think what are what is the most productive and sustainable land use practices that we, we might be using? And also what land use practices do we already use? What are already implemented that are sustainable within the farming community? In many ways, the failure of rewilding Britain to gain local acceptance teaches us that in emotive cases like this, the question might not actually be about how we approach nature, the wild, land management change, but rather a question of how we approach our relationships with each other. Thank you.